Greetings again, brethren. We're coming down to the close of this study. And as I said earlier at the beginning of these studies, these studies help me to study as well. And I really pray that they have been a blessing to you guys. And I really pray that these studies will be shared with others as well, because sometimes we do have a very strange tendency of keeping things to ourselves and not sharing it with others. And we have to share these truths because you'd be very surprised how much people are out there who are searching. A lot of people are looking at the world and even when I speak to unbelievers or when I just listen to them carefully on the train or on the bus, they all know that something is not right. Years ago, people would never talk about things They're like, well, that's far away, I really don't care. But as things are coming closer home, people are beginning to take note that things are just not quite right in the world, but they just don't know where to go for the answer. And I'm really praying that as God's people, those who are seeking, pray to God wherever you are, in your homes, in your communities, in your workplaces, or in your places of study, ask God just to give you an opportunity to open that door so you can let someone who has no idea of who God is to reach them. And as I always tell people, the best sermon ever preached is our lifestyle. Because sometimes we can talk till the cows come home, but sometimes people look at us and they can't really see what we stand for. So sometimes our lifestyle has to reflect, and I do talk from experience. So this study is kind of a continuation of yesterday's study, coming from a different angle. And we've looked at the book of Revelation for about three or four days. And we see that Christ is trying to prepare his people from the apostolic age down to the last age. And we've looked at the book of Revelation and how it is written in a style called typology, which is, in a nutshell, just history repeating itself. And this study today is called, Which Woman Would You Marry? So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. And this will be the opening text for this study. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. And when you found it, please say amen. Thank you for that one person who's found it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. As I still see people finding it, I will not read it until I know that everybody's together. So I'm not leaving anybody alone. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you. With what kind of jealousy? Godly. A godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to two husbands. How many? <coughs> One husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to just thank you for seeing us through another day. I don't know what people's day was like today, the Lord. I don't know whether their workplaces or their place of study or even their homes were stressful. But I pray the Lord that we can just give you honor that you've still seen us through today. And the Lord, we just want to give you thanks for even the smaller things. Sometimes the Lord, we take for granted that even though very clothes on our back and the very food that we eat is a blessing from you. And we just want to give you honor and praise the Lord because there are many people, the Lord, even as I was driving here today, I saw people, the Lord, sleeping out on the streets in the cold and it is not warm outside. So the Lord, we just want to give you honor and praise that you have seen us through another day. And the Lord, that you're still working on the hearts of a people, the Lord, who are struggling, but are still striving to make it to eternity. So the Lord, as I go through this study, I pray the Lord that as John the Baptist says, I must decrease 
and you truly must increase. So I pray that the glory and all the credit, the Lord, goes to your name and your name alone. So Lord, just please just bless the minds in here, the Lord. I pray, Lord, if there are any unclean spirits which want to enter into this place, I, at this time, rebuke them in the name of Jesus. So the Lord, just please protect this atmosphere and protect our minds so it is open for us to receive the truths you have in store for your people. So protect us, the Lord, and as I go through this study, just let every word that comes out of my lips be to the glory of your name. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this study is really a continuation of yesterday's study. And it's a question is, which woman would you marry? Now, if I was to ask that question to men out there, which I won't because I want the men who are married to not be on the couch this evening. So I won't ask them which woman would they marry. But if someone was to ask you which woman would you marry, what type of woman would you like? If someone was to ask me, I'd say I'd like a woman just like my mother. A woman who can, a woman who can, who can cook. <laughs> Even though I would be able to cook for her as well, amen. Because I can see some women taking off their heels. You need a woman who is very caring. But I want a woman who's also straightforward. Because I've been with some women before, and they're not very straightforward. They, they say everything's fine, and they're looking in their eyes, and they're like, you're lying to me. So if I was looking for a woman to get married to, she has to be real. She has to love God, and I want to see her striving. I don't like women who try to pretend that they're holy, because they get on my nerves. You know, I like people who are honest and straightforward and show me exactly who they are. So when we're looking for a woman um, as, as men, there is one woman who a lot of men wouldn't want. I think, they, I think it's in Proverbs chapter 21. Could be wrong in the wrong chapter. But the Bible says it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a brawling woman. That's where the snakes and the crocodiles and the cockroaches. So a man don't want a woman who's going to be nagging, 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 because it affects you. The Bible also says in the same chapter, in chapter 21 in Proverbs, it is better I think it's to be in the housetop. That's in the attic. You know, attics are not warm at all. But God said it is better to be in the attic than with a brawling woman. So when a man is looking for a woman, he's looking for somebody who's just going to look after him, even though he has to look after her as well. Amen? Because when you read the book of 1 Peter chapter, I think it's chapter 3, the Bible says if a man does not look after his wife, his prayers will not be answered. I know some of your men were saying amen very loud. Now the amen are very quiet from the men. You know, when it comes to the men's responsibility, they go very quiet. But God, in the book of Revelation, has shown us two women. These women are very distinct from each other. And as we are winding down in this earth's history, and as the prophetic clock is coming to its grand finale, we're all deciding which women we want to marry. And this study here is just to show a, a small part of history and current day, where people at this time are choosing which woman they want to marry. Revelation talks of a pure woman in chapter 12 and verse 1. She is pure and she, throughout her history, is trying to be faithful to God. And during that duration, she experiences some serious blows, but she still lasted to the end. There's another woman who loves popularity. She wants all the men to clock her. As soon as she walks into the sanctuary, she wants men's heads to turn, even if the sermon is serious. And this woman here, is known as a whore and a harlot. And we are choosing each day which woman we want to marry. God has shown a woman who has been through a lot of trials. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. And we're deciding which woman we want to be like. A lot of people love to be around the popular crowd. People like to do things for popularity's sake. 
But this woman here is not a part of popularity. And when you read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, when it describes this woman, it says, and the, when the dragon, who's the dragon? Satan. Okay, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, saw that um, he was cast onto the earth, he did what? Persecuted. Persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So we can see that this woman is under constant pressure. She is persecuted. And let me ask a question. If you are living a life of apostasy, are you going to get persecuted? Are you? Let's give some type of apostasy. In the Spectator magazine, this is an English magazine. The Church of England does not have much stands for its principles. And even the world is telling the Church of England, stop being so wimpish. Because the Church of England does not stand on principles. And when you are wimpish, you are not going to get persecution. And when you compromise with the rest of the world, this is a group called Mary Mary. And they've done a song which many people thought didn't even represent Christ. It was called The God in Me. And here you can see they were singing this song. And in the music video was a famous rapper called Common and another man called Kanye West. Now, when you're a Christian and you're merging with the world, are you going to get persecuted? When you are one of the biggest preachers in the world and you're taking photo moments with some of the biggest R&B stars like Usher Raymond, are you going to get persecuted? When you're one of the biggest pastors in the world and you're taking pictures and signing contracts with the head of Sony Entertainment, are you going to get persecuted? So what brings persecution? What allows it to be persecuted? This church was persecuted. What allowed it to be persecuted? Have any of you guys gone through persecution in your homes, in your schools, and even in your churches when you stand for truth? Now what brings persecution? Go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. And the Bible tells us what brings about persecution because this church was persecuted. And there's a reason why she was persecuted. And there's a reason why we'll get persecuted. It is not because of compromise. It is when we stand. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, what will happen to them? Shall, shall suffer <coughs> persecution. So the reason why this church suffered is because she stood firm on Christ. You see, when you're compromising, the devil sees you as no threat to his kingdom. When you're mixing with the world, the devil's like, you pose no threat. But once you start mixing with the world, and I do not believe these people are witnessing to them, when you mix with these individuals, you pose no threat to Satan's kingdom. But when you start to stand for Christ, and especially if you're somebody influential, the devil will target you hard. So when you stand for Christ, the Bible says you will suffer persecution. And this is God's true church. But there's another church in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. And this church has a massive influence on the planet. Her influence is so immense that the Bible says it influences the earth. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. It says the mother, so this, is, this church is known as the mother of harlots, so she must have some children, and abominations of the earth. Now we have to understand what is a harlot. How do you play a harlot? Anytime God's people start to apostatize, God labels them as harlots. When you go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 16, and I think it's verses 1, 2, and 28, whenever God's people stray, now as I said throughout all these days, if I'm going too fast, Tell me to slow down. Because when I'm gone, I'm gone. So Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 28. We see the very similar language in the book of Revelation. Abominations, 
and harlots. And when God's people stray, they are described as a harlot. So if you read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 28, it says, Again, the word of the Lord said unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her what? Abominations. Thou hast played the whore with the Assyrians. So when God's people were messing around with surrounding nations, God calls her a whore because she starts to compromise. Because thou wast unsatiable, yea, thou hast played the what? With them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. So anytime God's people start to compromise who they are, God labels his own people as whores and harlots. That's what happens when God's people start to stray. Now, there's another definition for abomination. Now, who knows what an abomination is? There's many definitions for it. The Bible says lying lips is an abomination unto the Lord. The Bible says homosexuality is an abomination unto the Lord, but there's another abomination. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 15. This is why this church is called an abomination. Why is it an abomination? Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 15 says, He that does what? Justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. So when you justify the wicked and when you start to condemn the just, that also is categorized as an abomination. So we can see why this system is labeled as an abomination because she justifies all types of wickedness and sin. Now we're going back to God's true church in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And we're seeing how this church was distinct because they are what? Overcomers. Overcomers. So God's true church, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and I'm praying that when you go through this verse, you can actually see the words are talking directly to your heart. God says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And we eventually have to get to this stage in our Christian journey. They loved not their lives unto the death. That is the description of God's true church. They are overcomers and they love not their lives unto death. Now, when Christ was talking to the disciples, he put out a very strong statement to them. And when you read this text, we eventually have to get to this text in our mindset. Now, we just read here Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and love not their lives to the death. But in Luke chapter 14, and verse 26, Christ has a specific criteria to be his disciple. It says they love not their lives unto death. And when you read Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, Jesus says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, also, he cannot be my disciple. Very strong, isn't it? Very strong. But we have to get to that stage. That's what made me stand up. When I read this text many years ago, well, the other text in Matthew 10, where Jesus says, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's what made me make a stand. Because Jesus says, if you put any human being before me, you're not worthy of me. And for those of you guys who probably heard me over the night, you know I'm very close to my mums. But there were times I had to stand up to her to put Christ first. And that was a war. You know, someone's cooking for you every day. And you have to make that stand. That was a different war ground. Then the Bible talks of another church. And this church is compromise, compromise, compromise. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, we know that when we compromise, God says you are public enemy number one. The Bible says, the adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And this is talking about compromise. It doesn't mean to say that if you guys have friends in the world that you're an enemy. Because many of us have many friends in the world that we still need to reach them, amen? It's when we start compromising our position 
that's when God has a problem. Because many of us have friends in the world and many of us still have to reach those friends in the world because many of them don't even know who God is yet. So when it's talking about friendship, it's talking about compromising our position. Now this system here, the Bible talks in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 3 that it has a huge influence over the planet. Huge. This is how, this is what compromise does. The Bible says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of their fornication. So this is the influence this power has. And the Bible tells you the influence it has on world leaders. It says, and the kings of the earth, that is the world leaders, have committed fornication with her. And who else? The merchants. So these are the international bankers, the world financial markets. All of these people are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies or doing business with her. So this system has influenced the world through her own teachings. Now remember what it says, all nations have been influenced by this system. It says world leaders have been doing political dialogue with this system and international finance has also been working with this system. Now when you work with all these people for your own and they're benefiting financially, are you going to be faithful to Christ? Okay. So through this week, we've seen that this system is talking about the papacy. And over the years, we've seen some of the top men in government working with the papacy. And successive popes, this is Pope John the 23rd, standing on the right. Sometimes I get my left and right wrong, please forgive me. And this is President Eisenhower. And we can see this system has been able to influence so many different succeeding presidents. This is John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is here in the Vatican with Pope Paul VI. And John F. Kennedy said, I am an American first and I'm a Catholic second. And we know what happened to him. <laughs> and when he put the constitution about the church and many other things, he was a goner. But we can see here how this system has been able to make some of the most powerful men in the world always dressed in black in obedience to this system. And this is the immense influence this system has on the world. We can see here in the Vatican also, this is President Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had the most Roman Catholic um, administration in American history. And you can see him in the Vatican with Pope John Paul II. They are both now deceased. We can also see here Pope Benedict XVI, here would George W. Bush. And we can see here that even Pope Benedict celebrated his birthday in the White House. And we can see here the successor of Pope Benedict XVI and the successor of George Bush is President Obama. And some people are asking, why does this, why is this man come from nowhere? and become the president. He didn't come from nowhere. He was being groomed from when he was in Harvard. He studied in a Catholic school in Indonesia and he's working for the Catholic community in Chicago. So he was not elected, but selected. And we can see here how the powerful influence this system has over politicians and even over the scientific community. Do you guys know who this guy is here? Stephen Hawking's has been in the past a member of the Vatican Observatory. And you can even look it up on the internet. So we can see here some of the most powerful men in the world, the top scientists on the planet, have been working alongside the papacy. We can also see here how companies, are. when I set up my bank account many years ago in Barclays Bank in 2002, Barclays Bank was trying to promote the single European currency, known today as the Euro. Well, what's in the background? What's in the background? St. Peter's Basilica, Vatican City. And the Vatican, Barclays Bank, you can read this in a book called Inside the Vatican by Thomas J. Rees. Barclays Bank gives financial assistance to the Vatican. So the Bible is very clear that the merchants of the earth, the international bankers, the financial world works with this system. I found this book many years ago. It's called The Aquarian Conspiracy, published in 1980. 
and it documents the occult agenda for the world. And this book goes into detail of the occultic plan for the planet. And even when this book was written, it prophesied how J.R. Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings, is going to eventually dominate the thinking of children. But once you're doing a survey around the United States of America, Marilyn Ferguson, she's now dead, was researching who the most quoted writer was in the occult. When she was studying the occult in the New Age, there was just one man who everyone said they quoted the most. And his name is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And he's a Jesuit priest. And she found out that this man was the most quoted author in the New Age. In the field of science, have any of you guys heard of a, a theory called the Big Bang? Have you guys ever heard of the Big Bang? Yeah. And we know that the good majority of the world believes in the Big Bang. If any of you guys have a smartphone in your own time, type up the Big Bang and the history of the Big Bang. And it will tell you who introduced the Big Bang theory. It was a Roman Catholic priest called George Lemaitre. And thousands of the world believes in the Big Bang having no idea that they're following the teachings of a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. When the Bible says the nations have drunk of our wine, God wasn't playing around with words. This system here has an immense power over how people think. And her most effective way of dominating people's mind is through education. That's how she gets people. I was telling somebody earlier, the mark of the beast and the seed of the living God will be accepted all based upon your education. If you're educated in the truths of God and his word, you will not accept the mark of the beast. So education is very central. And this system here has very powerful influence even over Hollywood. Over the years, I used to sit down and watch loads of horrors. Now, when you had horror films and Dracula films, who did they always run to in these films for help? A Catholic priest. Always. If you studied the 1950s films all the time when they want help, they would always run to the Church of Rome. Even when I was younger, I watched a film called Ghostbusters. You remember a film called Ghostbusters? And I remember there was a scene where there was um, blood going down in the wall. Who did they run to for help? The Catholic priest. And as I've been watching films over the years, one powerful film was published in 1973. It was called The Exorcist. And The Exorcist was nothing more than the promotion of Jesuit priests. Until this very day, it's still seen as the most scariest film. But in the um, London Guardian, it says that the Vatican sanctions bond. Now, the new Bond films are very different to the old Bond films. They are more dark. Even when you read film reviews, they are saying that Daniel Craig and his acting is a lot more darker than people like Sean Connery. And the Vatican says that she sanctions all these things. And when the Bible says this system will have a powerful influence over the world, don't take what God says lightly. So this is the system that has all the nations in the world subject to her ideology, has the kings of the world, has the merchants of the world. Well, which woman would you marry? We're seeing here today that once we start telling people about the end times, what's going to happen? I took this picture in South Kensington Station in London, and it has a man saying the end is nigh. Well, what does Virgin say? Lighten it says, escape the doom and gloom at Virgin Active Health Clubs. Which woman are you going to marry? Because this woman is going to be preaching the end times, but we're going to see the reaction. They're going to say, listen, man, Greg, come on now, Greg, man, you don't need to preach the end time, just lighten up. Come on now, Monique, stop talking about you know, the end times, come out for a couple of drinks with the lads, lighten up. And you have to choose whether you're going to be a part of this church or whether you're going to be a part of the popular church. Which woman are you going to marry? 
God's true church has always had the highest level of civilization in the world. Did you guys know that? If you don't know history, and I can't wait till I get to heaven because you're going to have the best history lesson ever. I was doing some research on the church in the wilderness. This is a church in Africa, Asia, and Europe, which you're not going to hear about in most history books. And I was doing some research. I went into the um, School of Oriental and African Studies library, and I found an Islamic encyclopedia. And it mentioned this man here, who was a member of a church called the Assyrian Church or the Nestorians. Have you guys ever heard of the Nestorians? The Nestorians were Christians who were living throughout the Middle East. And this man called Hunayn ibn Ishaq is a man who taught Muslims science, chemistry, and mathematics. And the Muslim says that we are, this is the exact words from the encyclopedia, we are indebted to this Christian for our knowledge of how we build our mosques and how we have our Islamic civilization. And these Christians were the ones who taught Muslims their civilization. His name is Hunayn ibn Ishaq. And he has the oldest copy of the human eye. These Christians were so advanced in science. And this was a church which hardly anybody knows about. And guess what? They kept the Sabbath. We also had another church, the church in Ethiopia. And this is a bishop called Abba Gregorius Ethiopian, or Father Gregory the Ethiopian. He was also a member of one of the most isolated churches in the world in Ethiopia. He was a member of a church who also kept the Sabbath. Have you guys ever heard of Columba? I went to Scotland last year and I was studying the Celtic church and they had the highest civilization in Europe. When the rest of Europe was going on into the Dark Ages, Columba was going around the Scots and he was preaching to them about the everlasting gospel. And these Scots had a high level of artwork. People still have no idea how they were able to make such intricate artwork. And they had up to 70 different alphabetic scripts. And this is when the rest of Europe were in the Dark Ages and they also kept the Sabbath. And we can see in Ethiopia, look at the level of artwork of these churches. Men have come to Ethiopia and have scratched their head and they said, I do not know how on earth these individuals were able to make this level of artwork. And the churches in the wilderness, which hardly anybody knows about, had the highest level of civilization. You see this artwork here. If you were to ever go to Turkey, they will tell you this is a mosque because it has the um, pillars on the side. But it is a mosque now, but originally it was a church. And Islamic architecture is modeled after the Assyrian church architecture. And these are the ones who taught the Muslims how to build their level of architecture. So God, throughout the ages, has always had a faithful church who had the highest level of civilization. And these are the type of artwork they had. This is the dome type architecture which you see on mosques today. This is where Muslims have modeled their artwork from these churches which are in the Middle East. And this is actually a church in Cyprus. The church went so far that it even went into China. This is a man called uh, Mr. Peliot. He was a 19th century sinologist. And there was a cave they uncovered. And it had thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts alongside Buddhist manuscripts, but they also had Christian manuscripts that shows how far these Christians had penetrated in a Tang dynasty in the 7th century AD. So God's people have always been vibrant and have spread the gospel all around the world. So I want to be a part and remain a part of that church. You know, God's church has always been vibrant. You're never going to hear about these churches in the encyclopedias or any of the books. But during the Dark Ages, God says his true church went into the wilderness. And we know from previous studies, we talked of how many people were being persecuted during the Dark Ages. It was a very horrific time. But God says how this woman 
fled into the wilderness. But God said that he had a place prepared for her and there was a duration of time that this church would go under severe, intense persecution. How long was it for? How long was it for? Do you score how many? Now, what did we say a day is according to Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 and Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6? So for 1,260 years, God's church underwent some severe persecution. And a lot of the time she went into the wilderness. So the Bible says that his church is called a woman. Yeah? Okay. Now we want to prove from the Bible that a woman represents a church. Now what was the opening text? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. But first we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Where we know that in the church of Corinth, it was called God's church. But we're seeing here that God has called his true church a virgin. That clear? Second yeah. Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Now I'm going to go into another text. Because whenever a virgin gets married, she gets married to how many husbands? Now what is another name for a husband? Before a man is married, what is he called on his day? Groom. Okay, a groom. Is everybody clear on that? Is everybody clear on that? Because you all sound tired. Okay. So we can see here how Christ is described as a husband. Amen? And he's going to marry his church, which is, will be a virgin, a pure church. Now, let's verify and prove that Christ is a groom from his own words. Luke chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. And if I'm going too fast, I'm going to slow down. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees? But thine eat and drink. And he, talking about Christ, said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the who? So what did Christ call himself? Okay. And when he gets married, he's going to get married to his wife. And in the book of Revelation chapter 19, and I think it's verse 7, he describes his second coming as a marriage. So when we overcome the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the number of his name, we're going to be a part of that marriage when Christ returns. So the Bible says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the what? Marriage. The marriage of the Lamb has come and his what? wife hath made herself ready. So we know that his wife or a woman represents a church. Is that clear? Is that very clear, brothers and sisters? Yeah. Crystal clear? Yeah. Okay. So we see the Bible says how this church or this woman fled into the wilderness for 1,203 score days. Now we have to confirm and verify again that this is talking about God's church. So we're going to go into the previous chapter in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3 where it describes the same thing. So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6 talks of this woman going into the wilderness for 1,260 days. And Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3 says the exact same thing. But this time, she is called the two witnesses. Different name. So in the previous chapter, sorry, the succeeding chapter, she is called a woman. But in the previous chapter, she is called the two witnesses. And she's clothed in sackcloth. If you want to know what sackcloth represents, it represents mourning. So, who knows what the two witnesses are? Even though I've already given you the answer in the previous chapter. What is the two witnesses? Okay. Now, these people said the Old and the New Testament. Do you agree with them, brothers and sisters? You're right. Let's just prove it. And then we're going to see that the two witnesses are the Old and New Testament. Yeah? And we're going to prove from the Bible. Is that okay? Amen. With no opinions on the Bible. So go to Ephesians 2.20 first, just to lay a foundation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Now the Bible says that the foundation of God's church should be built upon the foundation of what? The apostles, that's the New Testament, amen? And the prophets, which is the Old Testament, yeah? Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
So the foundation of God's church is built upon the Old Testament and the New Testament. So is that clear, brothers and sisters? Is that, very, is that crystal clear? Okay. Now it is called the two witnesses. Now we want to prove from the Bible that the Old Testament and the New Testament is clearly the two witnesses. Yeah? So go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And we just want to let the Bible explain itself. We want to show that the two witnesses truly and clearly are the Old and New Testament. So Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. The Bible says, and this, what? Shall be preached in all the world for a, what? Witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. So can we see that the gospel here is known as the witness, yeah? Is that clear? Okay. Now, how do we know that the prophets represent a witness? Go to the book of Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. And it reads, To him give all the prophets what? that through his name and whosoever believe within his name shall receive remission of sins. So have we seen from the Bible clearly that the two witnesses are the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is the foundation of God's church? Is that clear, brothers and sisters? Amen. Is it clear from the Bible? Amen. Okay. Now as we come down to the close of this study, we're going to go back to this text again, and I'll give power unto my two witnesses. Now in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, it says how this woman or God's church fled into the wilderness, yeah? Is that clear? Yeah. And we're seeing the exact same description is given in verse 14. So this woman goes into the wilderness, but something helps her. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14, and the woman or the church were given to two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is what? Where she is what? Nourished. Nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So when this woman was being persecuted, something was helping her and driving her for 1,260 days. What was helping her? Who knows what was keeping this church? Anybody know what was nourishing her? How was he nourished? Somebody said it on point. What did he just say? Did he just say what he just said? What nourished God's church for 1,260 years? Go to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, and we're going to let the Bible explain itself. How was God's church nourished? What helped her to be nourished? 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. How was he nourished? And as we can see, all we're doing is allowing the Bible to explain itself. Amen? There wasn't one amen. <laughs> I was like, okay, no one was paying attention. The Bible says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the what? The words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So have we seen clearly, brothers and sisters, what she was nourished with? Is that clear? So she was nourished with the word. That's what kept her for 1,260 years. And that's what's going to make God's church different from the rest of the world, the word. So this is God's true church, and she is built upon the foundation of the word. And the question I'm asking you guys again, which woman are you going to marry? So we see this last woman here. And what makes her different to that pure woman is that she's bling bling. She's decked, she's corrupted, and she makes the entire world completely corrupted with her nastiness. And this is the corrupt church. But when we see God's true church, she's described as having a high level of purity. Amen. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. And the question I'm asking you guys again, which woman are you going to marry? 
we see God has given us two choices of two different women. One is pure, one is corrupt. One is pure, one is corrupt. And each day, we're deciding which woman we're going to marry. The wedding is coming very soon. Every single one of us have an invitation. But when you read Matthew chapter 22, Christ said that at the wedding, there were some who didn't have on a wedding garment. And that garment represents the character of Christ. And when Christ returns, I pray that every single one of us has on that garment. Because we are at this time, even though people can't see it, we are actually wrestling and deciding which woman we're going to marry. It happens in the little small things we do each day. Small things. And eventually, we're all going to be at that place we're going to decide, am I really going to follow God or not? And I'm praying that as God's people, in this time, you'll decide the best woman to marry. Please just pray for each other in these interesting times, but trying times. And let us decide who we are really going to serve. We are reaching that point where things are going to heat up. And the heat, I'd say, is a good thing. Because that's when God is going to really know who are his. Amen. So let's pray. And let's just ask that God can keep us sustained in these end times. I know the battle is getting intense. But God is going to have a people who are going to shine. And let us pray that we are those people. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I pray the Lord that I haven't discouraged anybody. I pray they're not disillusioned, but that they will make a decision, the Lord, of which is the best woman to marry. We have been given options, the Lord, and you haven't forced us to do anything. You've given us all a choice. And from the beginning of time, you have always offered man life and death. From the Garden of Eden, to the children of Israel, down to the gospel, down to the very last message to the world. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. You've always offered mankind life or death. And I'm praying the Lord that as we leave this place today, I know some decisions are very hard for some people. There are some who have not been baptized, but there are some who have been baptized. And at this time, they're going through the valley of decision. So I pray the Lord that every single one of us today will choose life. Because, dear Lord, it is not in your interest that any one of us are lost. So please, the Lord, just protect this church. I do pray, Lord, that also that the study has agitated the minds of the Lord so that people can go back and study. So the Lord just forgive us of our sins. If there's anything we've done today in thought, in word, in deed, which has gone contrary to what we claim we believe in, I ask at this time, Lord, for your forgiveness. So please, please forgive us, the Lord, and just please just help us as we continue in this journey. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen.